1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me draw your attention, please, to verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. I'm going to read it to you now in the New King James. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Let's pray, please. Well, Father, thank you so much for everything you do in our lives, even those things which are happening in our lives that we don't quite understand, we know that you do, and we know that you have a plan. We ask that you help us to be patient, to not waver, but to be firm in our trust in you, waiting upon you, Lord, to display more and more of Jesus and to reveal your wonderful plans for our lives. And we thank you for the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, communion. We ask, Father, that we might embrace your word this morning, coming with open minds, ready to learn, wanting to understand, Lord Jesus, what this means to you, why you want us to do it, and what it means for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. I've entitled the message this morning, Communion with Christ and His People. Next Sunday, we will return to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. I did want to let you know that we've made a change with respect to Communion Sunday. It is now going to be on the first Sunday of every month. We think it'll be a little easier to remember that. And one other thing about Communion being on the first Sunday of every month, you know that part in the communion passage where Paul says, now take the time to examine your heart, examine your lives, and to sort out whatever may need to be sorted out, and then take the Lord's Supper. Well, may I encourage you with this? You know, if you know, put it on your calendar, on your refrigerator, or your device, first Sunday of the month is communion, Maybe on Friday, a little reminder, hey, it's Friday, and communion's in just a couple of days. Lord, help me to start kind of examining my life today. Let me draw close to you this Friday, and let me draw close to you this Saturday. I want to really honor you at the communion table, and I want to, I just want to have my life, I want to just draw near to you, check my life, and uh, be pleasing to you. So that's, I'd, I'd like to encourage you with that. The cup of blessing was mentioned. The cup of blessing which we bless, we speak well of, we participate in it. Is it not a communion? Aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ, the symbolic blood of Christ. That is to say, it is not, that is to say, is it not one form of expressing the communion of the blood of Christ? It's one of the ways which we not only commune with the blood of Christ, but we're expressing 
that communion of the blood of Christ. With respect to the bread, or as it is in the margins of some uh, versions, called the loaf, which we break, is it not a communion of the body of Christ? Seeing that we who are many are one loaf, one body, for we all partake of one loaf. The word loaf helps to bring out more clearly the idea of unity intended to be set forth by the apostles. Remember, everything was new to the apostles at this last supper. Jesus was preparing them for the days ahead. And as is so often the case with us, they were learning. I'm learning things. You're learning things about the Lord. And he wanted them to know the importance of what they were doing. The bread and the wine, which had its roots in the Passover dinner, which God instituted to be celebrated by the Jews once a year to remember that God delivered his people out of the bondage and the slavery of Egypt. He set them free, and he brought them eventually into Canaan land. And he wanted them to remember that every year. God is the one who saved us. The communion service is like that. Christ is the one who saved us. I lived in Egypt once. I was in darkness once. I was in death once. But because of the blood of the lamb put on the posts of those homes, the death angel passed over. And those children, and that firstborn in that home was spared. And they were brought out. And through the blood of Christ being shed for my sins and my faith in him, I've been brought out of darkness and I've been brought out brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God. I'm no longer a child of darkness. I once was darkness, but now I am light in the Lord. I have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, into the kingdom of light. Now, There's nothing magical about the Lord's Supper. Nothing magical about the Lord's Supper. What we're doing is we're going to eat some bread and we're going to eat some, drink some juice. But what does the Lord's Supper mean? What does it mean? Well, it means this. It means communion with Christ and communion with one another. It speaks of an intimate relationship of communication. So what, is the, what does the Lord's Supper mean? Well, what is communion? The word communion comes from two words, union and the prefix C-O-M, which means with, so it means union with. Communion means union with. In fact, we must first enjoy union with Christ and with his church, or else we cannot enjoy communion. If a person is not united to Christ and not united to the church, there's no way they could enjoy something like this. You and I must be one with Christ in heart, in soul, in our life. We have been baptized into his death by the Holy Spirit. We have been quickened or made alive by his life. And so we have been brought to become members of his body. We are one with the whole church of which he is the head. So 
we're one with the First Assembly of God down the street here. We're one with the Gateway Community Church. We're one with some church underground in the midst of Iran tonight. If they are in Christ, we're united together, separated by distance. We cannot have communion with Christ until we are in union with Christ. Now, unsaved people do not have Christ. They are without Christ. But in the process of salvation, the Holy Spirit of God unites your soul with Christ. It's a mystery, of course, but we know it's true because the Bible says it's true. We've been placed into Christ. If I received an, if I received an organ that was donated, the organ would have been out here, and now it is in my body. You and I were once out here, apart from Christ. God the Holy Spirit, in his grace, his mercy, his love, his compassion, in the process of salvation, we were united with Christ. We are in Christ. So we and I, you and I can't even have communion with Christ until we are in union with Christ. And we cannot have communion with the church till we are in vital union with him. My union with the church starts with my union with Christ. We cannot have communion with the church till we are in essential union with Christ. So there's a lot to learn together. And I don't want you to think that Pastor Bob, you probably wouldn't think this anyways, but I don't want you to think that Pastor Bob knows a whole lot about a lot of things. I really am so interested in learning more deeply about something that is so sacred. It has to do with the most important event that has ever happened or ever will happen on the face of the earth. It was instituted by the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one whose name is above every name the one who declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is no one beyond him. He instituted this. And there's so much to learn. And this morning we're going to look at things like communion, fellowship, and enjoyment communion, fellowship, and enjoyment. So to begin with, the teaching of the Lord's Supper is just this, that while we have many ways of communion with Christ, yet the best way of communion with Christ, yet the receiving of Christ into our souls as Savior is the best way to have communion with Christ. Receiving him into our souls. Yes. As God's precious sheep, I'm saying to you that we have a lot of ways to commune with him. Let me show you that that's a fact. Communion is ours by personal association with the Lord Jesus Christ. How so? Well, we speak to him in prayer, don't we? When we speak to him in prayer, what does he do? He speaks back to us while we're praying. Do you know that some of us speak more often with Christ than we do with our wives or children? We spend time being very intimate with him, telling him many, many things, and we go home and, how are you? Fine. Uh, everything okay? Yeah, when's dinner? Mm -hmm. Dodgers are on. Mm -hmm. Think I'll go to bed. Mm -hmm. 
Hope it's not that. For some, our fellowship with Jesus is more thorough than our fellowship with our nearest friend. When you and I are, when we are in our times of meditation and thanksgiving, we actually speak with our risen Lord, and by the Holy Spirit, he answers us, how? By creating fresh thoughts and emotions in our mind. When we spend time really meditating on the Lord, and we're thanking him, it's almost without fail God is going to open up to you something you've not thought about, or it's just fresh. Our communion with Jesus is of a closer sort than any words, any words could possibly express. Sometimes we are in such close communion with him, we don't even say anything. We're struck with him. Maybe we sit in silence for five, ten minutes. And finally say, Father, Lord, I don't know what to say. Our hearts melt when we're in that type of communion. They melt because of the warmth of Christ's love. And then they dart upward our own love in return. Please don't think that I'm dreaming or carried off by the memory of some unusual rhapsody. No. I'm asserting that the devout, serious soul can converse with the Lord Jesus all the day and can have as true fellowship with him as if he still dwelt bodily among men. Did you say your prayers yet in the morning? Did you say your prayers yet at night? Did you say your prayers yet at dinner? Did you say your prayers in your closet? We can converse with him all through the day. I remember the first time that ever occurred to me. I was teaching my children how to fly kites over here at, is it Westmoreland School on, um, is that County Center? It's over there somewhere. And I remember they were flying kites, and that was fun. Yeah, I used to do that. But I remember just, I started talking to the Lord in my heart, and I thought, I can, I can talk to Jesus right here. And then I began to realize over the years that Jesus isn't a, though his body is at the right hand of the Father, God is omnipresent, the Father is there in heaven, he is a spirit, but it's the mystery of God that God is right here. He's right here in this room. He's, we, in him we live and move and have our being. And sometimes I think, oh, Lord, hello. You're right here. I can't see you, but you're right here. A devout soul can have that kind of conversation with the Lord, just as if he was here on earth. Lord, brush my teeth, Lord. <laughs> Got to go to the dentist later. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lord, for toothpaste. 
This isn't something I've read about that I'm teaching you about, by the way, but rather it is my own personal experience, and I would imagine it is many of yours as well. I do know for sure that our Lord Jesus Christ manifests himself unto his people, and he does not manifest himself unto the world of unbelievers. We are his family. He manifests himself to us. And what sweet communion often exists between the saint and our Lord Jesus Christ, even when there is no bread or wine upon the table, because the Holy Spirit himself draws the heart of the born-again Christian, and it begins to run after Jesus. Those times when you realize, I want to find him here. I want to talk to him. I want to be in communion with him. And the Lord himself appears to that kind of a longing heart. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. Here is a question. You don't have to raise your hand. Do you enjoy the kind of fellowship that we've just been talking about? You don't have to raise your hand. Do you enjoy that kind of fellowship? Another way of communion with him is with his, his thoughts, his views, his purposes. His thoughts, in many ways, are our thoughts according to our capacity and our sanctity. You know there's that verse, my thoughts are not your thoughts, as high as the heavens are above, it's, you know that scripture? But in also, his thoughts are our thoughts according to the capacity within us of the scriptures that we know and are walking with him and our sanctification with him. True believers have the same view of things that Jesus does. That which pleases him pleases us. That which grieves him grieves us. To give you an example, consider for a moment the greatest theme of our thought and whether our thoughts are not like those of Christ's thoughts. What, what would be in your own mind the greatest thought you could ever think and now ask yourself this question, isn't that in the mind of Christ? He delights in the Father. He loves to glorify the Father, don't we? Don't we? Does not our spirit cry out, Abba? Jesus used that very word when he spoke to the Father. He called him Abba in that language. The word Abba actually literally means daddy. Seems odd, but it, it speaks of the daddy, a little child. We feel as Jesus feels towards the Father. He loves the Father, and so do we. We have true communion with his thoughts. And you know, as you meditate upon the Lord and thank him and bless him and 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 praise him in a way that is makes sense and whatnot. One instance of that 
your, your time of contemplation can spur within you a wider variety of talk, topics that we can think with Jesus. And I, I just to slip this in. To me, one of the, I don't like to use the word magical, but to me, one of the most helpful things a Christian can learn in talking to God, having communion with God, there's nothing wrong with asking God for the needs we have. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those, and lead us not into temptation. But to, those are all requests. But you'll notice at the first part of the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we learn about who God is, we can then talk with him about what he has revealed to us as to who he is. He is eternal, isn't he? Right? What does that mean? He had no what? And no end. I remember asking my mother when I was probably 20. No. When I was just a little boy, I said, how could that be? She said, I don't know, but it is. Father, you never started anywhere. Lord, how wonderful you are. We also have communion with Christ in our emotions. Haven't you felt the horror of hearing someone slandering the name of God and using it in such a profane way and you yourself maybe were more profane than that person prior to your salvation and now when you hear it it just it hurts you in your stomach doesn't it or people that yell and they say you know go to and you know what this, they're going to say you think do you really realize what you're saying that's horrible Jesus had emotions. He wept. He was grieved. Jesus felt when he saw sin and he bore it in his own person, he, he felt it and he saw it, only he felt it and he saw it infinitely more than we do but we have the same emotions haven't you felt some degree of sorrow when you've looked at a sinner whom you know is at that moment on their way to hell hasn't it made you sad and grievous Have you ever wept over your children who've gone astray? Have you ever wept over friends or wept over our nation or wept over the church and you cried? Those tears have the same ingredients in them that were in the tears of Jesus. Same te man, man, tear, tear. He wept over Jerusalem because of their rejection of him. We have the emotion of zeal in our 
life for God, or we have a hatred for sin. And I know that, that as a person grows in maturity, uh, they never stop sinning, but they sin less and less, and they don't want to even think about things that they used to think about. They don't want to see things that they were content watching. Uh, they don't like to say things that they used to say because they begin to detest that kind of, those kinds of things and falsehoods. We care for people. We're being like Christ in our emotions. We're having true communion with Jesus. We have had fellowship with Christ in many of our actions. Take this for example. Have you ever tried to teach someone who is completely ignorant of the gospel of Christ? Have you ever tried to witness to someone who is so hard-hearted with the gospel of Christ? And did you find it easy or difficult? Jesus found it easy sometimes, and he found it difficult sometimes. In fact, he would have thousands of people who didn't understand him. You'd think, what, they didn't understand him? Wait a minute, this is Jesus. How could they not understand Jesus? Well, there was nothing wrong in Jesus. Where lay the problem? Within them. Have you ever tried to get a backslider to slide forward? Sometimes, yes. A lot of times, no. You were in communion with the good shepherd just like he was when he went out into the wilderness after that one sheep. He found the sheep, laid it on his shoulders, and he brought it home rejoicing. Have you ever waited up at night and watched over a soul day and night with tears crying about a relationship, a human being, somebody in your life? then you've had communion with him who has all of our names upon his broken heart and he carries the memorial of them upon his pierced hands. In fact, in acts of self-denial, generosity, benevolence, and devotion, we enter into communion with him who went about doing good. How about when we try to disentangle the snarls of a strife and we're trying to make peace between men who are at odds with one another? Well, we're, if we're doing that, then we are doing what the great peacemaker did. And we have communion with the Lord, who is the giver of peace. Wherever indeed we cooperate with the Lord Jesus in his designs of love to me, we are in true and active communion with him. Lord Thank you. You love me. You love me. Thank you. Sometimes I, you do, you love me. Oh, you love me. Thank you. Same with our sorrows. Not everyone, certain of us, have had large communion with Christ in affliction. Large communion with Christ in affliction, and Jesus wept. Jesus lost a friend, and so have we. We grieve over the hardness of people's hearts, so does Jesus. 
He knows that grief, so do we. Do you remember the young rich man who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus said, oh yeah, just a couple, one thing. And he kind of straightened him out. And what did the young man do? He turned around and took off. Jesus was sorry about that. What about the people you try to just live your Christian life before? You're not slamming him, you know, slamming him in the head with a Bible and all of that, but you're, you're trying to have wisdom and prudence and, and, and they just go away. People who have the gift of mercy, sympathetic hearts and live for others, they readily, readily enter into the experience of the man of sorrows. Jesus has a sympathetic heart. He came here living to die for other people. He was known as the man of sorrows. How about the wounds of being slurred? The wounds of false accusation. All of that from proud, unknowing people. What about the venom of those who won't tolerate you? What about the criticisms, the treachery of the false, and the weakness of the good? We have known in our own measure and therein have had communion with our Lord Jesus Christ. He has been tempted in all points like as we are. That's not all. We've been with him in godly joys. I would like to think, and I think it's true, that there probably never lived a happier man than Jesus. Think about it. Was he ever bitter? Did he ever hold a grudge against anybody? Did he ever sin? So he had no guilt, right? Never, when mama wasn't looking, punched James in the nose. Those things make you unhappy, don't they? He was happy. In fact, when he started his first great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, happy, 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 happy. He described the characteristics of people who are born again and walking with Christ. He said, you're happy if this is the way you look. You're happy if this is, you're happy if this is the way you live. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. And how about when he called that wicked Matthew, the tax collector, hated by all of the Jews because he stole from them. He must have been so happy uh, he could realize Matthew was getting nervous as he started coming over there to his tax booth and he didn't know what's going to happen here and Jesus looked at him and he said, Matthew, I want you to come and follow me. He knew what was going to happen to Matthew. What a joy he had in seeing the, the boys fighting with one another, getting all mixed up, and he'd say, come over here. And he'd tell them a story to straighten them out. He'd be so happy. He has so much to be happy about. He sings over us. He rests over us in his love. He went to the cross for the joy that was set before him, knowing, knowing that he would bring many souls to salvation. Maybe when he left heaven, by Father, by Son, he said, wait till you see what I bring back, Father. It's going to be wonderful. They're mine. They were yours. You've given them to me, but I'm giving them back to you. The ones you've given me, I haven't lost any of them. They're all together, and I'm going to bring them all home.
How about the joy of finding a lost sheep, poor little sheep? How about the joy when he was there with Peter and he grabbed a fish and don't you think he kind of smiled? He said, here, take this. His work was his joy. Such joy that for its sake, he endured this cross despising the shame. The exercise of compassion and generosity is joy to the loving hearts. 10.45, 11.45. What time does this service get over? When? 12, 50, 12.50? 12.49. 12.15. I just realized, I thought, oh my goodness, what's going on here? The exercise of compassion, generosity in our lives is, is joy to a loving heart. The more pain it costs, the more joy it is. Kind actions make us happy and joyful. And in such, we find communion with the great heart of Jesus. He was a happy person. So we've just looked at many different ways of our communing with Christ, but as we learn about and participate in the Lord's Supper, we will find that it surpasses them all. It is the most accessible and most effectual means of fellowship. It is a picture for us. Here it is by remembering our Lord at his table. We who were guilty remember this, that he atoned for our sins. We who rejected God were sought out by the Savior. These elements reveal the most important event that has ever taken place in the history of the world. There is another side of communion, namely the fellowship of true believers with each other. We have many ways of communing with one another. But there is no way of mutual communing with one another like the common reception of the same Christ in the same way. That's the greatest. We can commune with one another, but... I've received Christ, you've, that's the greatest. That's always the greatest. But what are some of the ways that we can commune with one another? Well, we can commune with one another by holy conversation, talking about God. I, I had a friend at my house yesterday for an hour, and uh, we just yak 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 whole hour talking about the Bible and about Jesus. I said, here, I got a Bible for you, you know. Just happy, happy, happy. We're communing with one another. I wish we all had more of that kind of conversation. What a joy it is to talk about Christ with other people. Oh, yes, I, I know that the Cubs and the Giants and the Dodgers, and you know who's the, bat, the hitters, the batters. The, that, that's all good. By the way, I'm taking bets after the... the <laughs> but what about Jesus? What about Jesus? Sadly... I'm afraid that not many people speak that way with one another. They've never done it. It is a sad thing to see and hear Christian brothers and sisters gossiping, backbiting, tail-bearing. They never fellowship with others about Christ. That's all they talk about. Sad, sinful. It is a grievous thing to often see love lies bleeding by the hand of a Christian. Instead of communing in Christ, of doing something to hurt another person, perhaps in ways you could never think of.
where we may not be as bad as that, yet we are often bashful and we, as a result, miss worthwhile opportunities to communicate with one another. A lot of times uh, in our home, I'll say, honey, you know, I'm reading this book. Could I read some of the, oh yes, please. Please read that to me. I mean, maybe you as a husband are uncomfortable with saying, uh, <clears throat> honey, could we <clears throat> talk about Jesus? Say, honey, let's read this book together. Do you know how thrilled she would be if you step up and Mr. Prince Charming, afterwards she can say, you, but then you're, forget that, okay? Prince Charming in a spiritual sense. Help me, Lord. Help me, Jesus. We are children of one family. We have one Father, one Savior, one Holy Spirit, one salvation, one forgiveness, one hope, one continuing comfort of the Holy Spirit, and one gracious and merciful God. I'm afraid of this, that Christian brotherhood and communication begins and ends inside the church doors. Starts there, never heard from again afterwards. Let it not be so among us. You know something that, did I, do you know something that will help you? I don't know, if, did I talk to you about my notes here? Do you know something that'll help you talk about the church services? You can, I can send you my notes on an, on, by email. I send them Wednesday afternoon and Saturday afternoon. If I don't send them, what do the ladies know? I'm probably not here. Or my computer went down. <laughs> Sometimes I just, anyways. But if you would like these notes, they're, uh, we charge you quarterly. There's a one-day grace period. No refund, and you'll be put in collections after two days. They're free, 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 and they're helpful, helpful, helpful. That give you something to think about, look about. Say, honey, let's read over these notes by Pastor Bob. Oh yeah, I remember he said. Oh yeah, I remember he said that. So let let's let our be let our delight. Let it be our delight to find in our community and in the circle of which Jesus is the center. And let's make friends of those who are friends of Jesus. Christians have fellowship together in their thoughts, in the essentials of the gospel, in the thoughts of God, of Christ, sin, holiness. We keep in step with one another. Our minds, our thoughts, desires, and hopes are in Christ. And in all of this, we have communion with one another. Our emotions are another road of royal fellowship. What a joy and a comfort it is to sit down with someone one who's suffering and you're able to comfort them. Or to sit down and have one, someone tell you their story. Hear the story of the joy of salvation and deliverance. Real harmony exists among all true Christians. Christians are one in Christ. And there's so many other things. We should take care to enjoy our fellowship. We should take great care of it. Let's take care that when we enjoy our fellowship of communion, that in the elements we see a mirror of what God has done. Haven't we eaten and drank and yet sometimes never seen Christ and gained no benefit by taking the Lord's Supper? No noticeable benefit. 
there are ways to take care so as to benefit from the Lord's table. We need to discern the Lord's body. He is here with us. These emblems re speak of his body. We need to discern what this is all about. We can accept him, as it were, not for salvation, but in our sanctification, we can just accept him afresh. All that Christ is to any, he shall be to me. We can come with an attitude like this. Does Christ save sinners? He has saved me. Does he change men's hearts? He, he has changed mine. He is all in all to those that trust him. He shall be all in all to me. It's the embracing of Christ. When you have received Christ, don't fail to rejoice in him as having received him. How many times are there who have received Christ, but they talk and act as, they never, as if they never had received him? Coming to this table and acting as if you'd never received him. Someone said, it is a poor dinner of which a man says after he has eaten it that he feels as if he had not dined. And it is a poor Christian of whom anyone can say, I have received him here, as it were, through these elements, but I am none the happier, none the more at peace. There's nothing magical here. There's nothing that we... gin up but listen if you have received Jesus Christ into your heart you are saved you are justified God looks at you just as if you had never sinned you are born again you are set apart for Christ you are in union with Christ you were loved by God before creation. You were always the Father's, but he gave you to Jesus. You were adopted into God's family, and you have been redeemed from sin and Satan. Are you, is it whispering in your ear? Are you whispering in your ear, I hope so, I hope that's true? Or do you know it's true? Well, let me end with this thought. For the hopes and hopelessnesses of so many who are going in a poor way, you can stop it. Put both feet down and say this, I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You are either saved or lost. There is no state in between the two. You are either pardoned or condemned. If you have received the atonement, be as glad as you can be. If you are still an unbeliever, rest not until Christ is yours.
Our beloved is not a friend for Sundays only, but for that week, for the weekdays as well. Jesus is the inseparable companion to his loving disciples. For those who have had fellowship with his body and his blood at this table may have the Lord as a habitual guest at their own tables. Those who have met their master may expect him to make their dwell make expect him to make their dwelling bright with his own presence. This will give us some heaven below. We're going to uh, open these uh, up here, please. And um, please make your way forward as you uh, feel to and come and take your bread and your juice. And if you'll just hold on to it till the end, we'll, we'll take it all together. Father, Lord Jesus, you took the loaf of bread, you broke it, 
you must have joyfully handed it out to the disciples and you asked them you said this is my body take it take it eat all of it it's broken for you Jesus thank you for breaking your body having your body broken on the cross for us so we Take this bread in remembrance of you. It's the blood of God, God who became a man bled he bled he bled he bled it's his blood he shed his blood for the remission of our sins there there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood the blood the blood of bulls and goats wouldn't do it it had to be a perfect man Jesus, when you handed that cup to the apostles, I'm certain you were thinking of everyone else down through the ages who were also going to become yours. How glorious. We take this, Lord, in remembrance of you. Can we forego announcements today? Is that possible? There's a lot of information in your bulletin. There's important stuff coming up. Are we good?